Hello, welcome to the Friday, June 21st, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Washington, D.C. Dell today released a security bulletin for its support assist software. The vulnerable component that's actually being updated here is PC Doctor. Now, the vulnerability is probably one of the less severe vulnerabilities I've seen in tools like this. It's really just an untrusted DLL loading library. So if an attacker is able to place a DLL on a system running support assistant, then support assistant may load that DLL and execute code included in it. What makes this, of course, a bit more problematic is that support assist does have system access and, uh, well, is pretty much running unrestricted because it does have to have access to pretty much everything in the system. The home version of the software should update automatically if you do run the business version, then you may have to apply the patch manually. The scope of this problem may actually go beyond Dell in this particular case. The researcher who found this vulnerability and reported to Dell, Pelek Harder, uh, says that a PC doctor may also be included with PCs from other manufacturers. And we can only hope that PC Doctor, the same company actually also makes the entire support assist package, is applying these patches to versions that they are delivering to other computer makers. Of course, uh, for many of the listeners here, it's probably standard practice uh, to wipe a new PC and install the operating system from scratch. Not 100% sure what you exactly lose if you are removing support assist, but often it does hurt you if you are then calling support and they're asking for a particular troubleshooting or diagnostic report from that software. And Cisco has been somewhat on a roll for the last two days. They released a total of 26 different updates, if I counted them right. Three of them are rated as critical. The one that concerns me the most is a remote command execution vulnerability in the RV110W, RV130W, and RV215W routers. The problem here is an unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability in the web management system. So no username and password required, only web access required to the admin interface. Shouldn't be that terribly hard to exploit once someone figures out what the exact problem was here. But well, as a regular listener here of this podcast, you probably learned by now that it's a pretty bad idea to expose these web-based admin interfaces regardless of the manufacturer of your network gear. And ESET is reporting that they came across a new type of crypto miner infection that they are calling loud miner. The crypto coin miner at the core of it is actually good old XM rig, a Monero miner. But in this case, it comes with a complete virtual machine, even though that's tiny core Linux, a fairly minimum virtual machine and virtualization software like QEMU or VirtualBox. This is packaged with virtual studio technology software. So software that's often used for audio productions and the like, and maybe that explains how this malware can be so massive and include all of these components. It's very possible that they're actually going this route in order to evade antivirus because the virtual machine itself is probably not properly scanned and the virtualization software like VirtualBox is of course not recognized as malicious. Otherwise, it's hard to explain the effort to distribute and install all that software. XMRig, the miner that's being used here to create a Monero 
is mostly used on Linux, but also available on Windows and definitely does run pretty easily on Mac OS. So this virtualization component isn't really required to make this particular piece of software work. And well, uh, today for Friday, we do have yet another STI student with us. Today I got David Todd and uh, David wrote an interesting paper about uh, some of the issues in implementing biometrics. Uh, David, could you just introduce yourself, please? Thanks for the invite. Uh, yes, my name is David Todd and I'm actually in my last year of the uh, Master's in Information Security Management program. Uh, should be finishing up my classes here uh, in the December timeframe. So biometrics is certainly a hot topic. You know, people trying to come up with better and more convenient ways to authenticate. Uh, but a lot of people feel a little bit uneasy about sort of handing over their fingerprints or whatever you're using there for authentication. I think uh, you really focus sort of on some of these legal challenges. Or can you just briefly summarize what you found there? Sure, I'm happy to do that. I, I'm in, an, I think, an interesting position where, uh, you know, I'm currently the chief information security officer for a hotel manager management company and uh, was in the process of implementing biometrics at our organization. And uh, the, uh, the project completely just halted in the uh, implementation phase. And that's really what drove the research, because I was surprised that the primary issues that I was having was not really technology related. And, you know, which should I use fingerprint scanning or proximity readers or facial recognition, uh, which is where I thought my issues would be. It was more around, how can I do this without getting sued? And uh, I was really surprised. And uh, so we, we actually stopped the project and uh, I circled back and worked with general counsel and, uh, and uh, started looking at the legal aspects of implementing biometrics. I'm certainly spending quite a bit of time in hotels and always, of course, interested in hotel security and they keep my data secure. Now, um, the authentication, was it more focused uh, towards employees or uh, did you also try to authenticate customers here? Great question. No, the uh, our program was to implement biometrics for our employees. There were three primary things that we were trying to do. Number one, was to implement biometrics on the time clocks to avoid what I would call buddy punching, where friends are punching for uh, for their coworkers who are running late. Number two was to help eliminate password sharing, which was a really common problem that our organization is facing, and it's really been hard for me to stop. And then uh, number three uh, was really more operational. Uh, we actually have a 12-character password at our organization, and it expires every uh, 60 or 90 days. Uh, and uh, people were forgetting their passwords and causing all kinds of issues where, where they weren't able to log in. And so we wanted to speed up the process, especially for our guests who are checking in at the hotels. We didn't want our front desk uh, managers and representatives spending a lot of time trying to get their passwords reset when they had a line of guests trying to, uh, to check into the hotel. Convenience really seems to be one of the big drivers of biometrics or uh, because just the challenges that you outlined. Now, what were some of the legal issues that you ran into there? We decided to, uh, to implement our pilot uh, with hotels uh, in Illinois and also in Indiana. And we were in the process of implementing the, we selected fingerprint scanners uh, they're just USB connected fingerprint scanners at the front desk of several hotels in the uh, in Illinois. And w once we got the software, the hardware implemented, everything was working fine. Our installer, which was an outside consultant, just said, "Hey, by the way, since we're in Illinois, do you have waivers for all of your employees?" I had no idea what he was talking about. Mm. I said, "What do you mean waivers?" <laughs> and he goes, "Well, in Illinois, has some really tough biometrics laws, and uh, you need you." you probably should have waivers. And by the way, here's a sample one, just have them sign this. And that made me really miss. And uh, I immediately contacted our general counsel who I have a great relationship with. Uh, she did some research I did, and talked with even outside counsel. Come to find out, Illinois has probably the strictest biometrics laws in the country. So interesting, that's actually on a state-by-state -state basis, sir. Usually what thing like California or so is you know, different. Uh, have, have you run into any problems there? Or a lot of times when you, you think about the coast, the different coasts, you know, Massachusetts, New York, or um, you're looking at California, 
uh, Washington, et cetera. Typically, some of these more private uh, privacy related laws are in the coast. Uh, I didn't see them in California. Um, it was interesting. And so when we started doing research, there is no federal privacy law related to uh, biometrics to help me at all. So it is left up to each state. And when I started doing research, interesting enough, Illinois, of course, we ran into it. They have the Biometric Information Privacy Act, or BIPA. Texas uh, was the, uh, the second state right after Illinois to implement a biometrics law in 2000. I believe that was 2009. And again, Texas is not a state typically that I would look at for more strict privacy laws. But the third was on the coast, was Washington State. And, uh, and again, there was a big gap. So Texas, Illinois was 2008, Texas in 2009, and then Washington State uh, implemented their biometrics law in 2017. Were you at least able to use the same wafer in all of these different states? Or uh, did you have to come up with different wafers for different states? No. So that was what we wanted to do. I mean, we have hotels in, 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 in almost every state. And what we didn't want to do is to customize a solution state by state. And that was really what drove to creating this biometrics compliance framework. And we decided to take the, the, the most strict compliance regulation or the most conservative regulation and then adopt that across all of our states and come up with a common framework. So one implementation that would be defensible regardless of what state you're in. That's nice to have that. Uh, did you have to deal at all with non-US laws or are you just uh, focused uh, on the US? We're a US-based uh, company only, so we only focused on US. It would be a great study. I would love to expand <laughs> it to look at international yeah. laws. Um, I did not look at that at all, but I would, that's yeah. maybe that's my next paper. So. That, that sounds even more challenging. Anything cyber related tends to be really complex once you uh, take it international uh, from a legal point of view. Right. Uh, but uh, so your, your paper outlines uh, basically what you found and has some of these frameworks so that you came up with? Yes, yeah, certainly. So in, what I tried to do is, uh, and you'll see in the paper, there's, there's a, a table in the paper where I've identified all of the terms, uh, certain uh, requirements or controls, uh, what the penalties are, the reporting requirements by state, and it lists Illinois, Texas, and Washington, and it states whether that's a requirement or not a requirement. Uh, what's interesting is some of the states don't even specify what, whether it's a requirement or not. And, uh, and I would say it's, you know, and I have my fingers in quotes, it's implied that it's a requirement. Um, but uh, so in that particular case, if it, it doesn't necessarily exclude it, I just put not specified in the table. And um, so as you're looking across the different requirements, and a great example would be um, uh, consent. So is consent from the employee required in order to store biometrics? Um, Illinois explicitly says, well, all three states say that consent is required. But Illinois is the only state that says consent is required in writing. Um, I found that really interesting. So in our implementation, we just made uh, the requirement, it, um, the consent has to be in writing. It can't be just verbal consent. Well, uh, that sounds uh, really great. Anything, yeah, what's up next? Uh, so you're going to look at it globally now or uh, what are you working on right now? No, well, I, I think now what I'm going to look at is there are more states, uh, you know, Michigan, Alaska, um, uh, I believe it was Delaware, um, but there's several other states with legislation pending in the biometric space. Uh, so I'm going to expand. I, uh, what I try to do in, the, in our, my master's program anyway is I try to make the research that I'm doing relevant to what I'm doing at work. Yeah, so that's a great so, idea. And, since we're not an international-based company, I think my focus is just going to keep expanding the table. So rather than looking at three states, start adding these other states mm -hmm. to the biometrics compliance framework. Well, uh, that sounds great. And I'll add a link uh, to your uh, paper to the show notes if anybody's interested in that. So uh, thanks again uh, for joining me here and explaining some of these intricate details here uh, to our audience. Thanks. Sounds great. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.